Good morning, I'm Serena Wilson and I am a training manager at the Department of Children's Services. I'm glad to provide support and facilitation at our first installment of the Back to School webinar series with partners of DCS and partners in the communities throughout Tennessee. Today we have Dr. Tim Perry, who is gonna present on the impact of the pandemic on families. Um, we have all been impacted by the pandemic and now school is starting again. Um, there's uh, lots of uh, uh, ways to look at the pandemic. Um, and I'm so glad to have Dr. Perry, who is a licensed professional counselor and a board certified clinical supervisor with a doctorate in theology and master's in counseling. He's been in the mental health field for children for over 25 years, and he has worked at Frontier Health for more than 20 years and has been a case manager, a therapist, director, coordinator, supervisor, and director before his current role as senior vice president for children's services. He's naturally, nationally certified in domestic violence, forensic specialist, and has tremendous accolades from uh, the governor, TCCY, and other um, federal committees and agencies. So again, a longstanding career in child advocacy and counseling, behavioral and mental health. And so I'm very excited to have him with us today uh, to gain greater understanding about the impact of the pandemic on the families that we serve as a community. So thank you so much, Dr. Perry, for being here. And I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Serena. I appreciate that. It's a privilege to be here and talk about such an important issue as, as how this pandemic has affected families across, not just Tennessee, but across our country. And we'll be focusing this as we look at the families with some research that we have, we have some preliminary data, we have some studies that have been done, some surveys that have been taking place and kind of seeing from the view of the family and as a whole, the family, what they have seen as a result of this pandemic and how it's affecting them. And, and then use some of that to kind of give us an idea of what we may expect in the next months or years, literally, after the pandemic has decreased and what we may be anticipating as far as behavioral health needs that the family may be experiencing. I appreciate, I appreciate Serena for being our, 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 our host and doing the slides for us. So if you'll go to the next slide. One of the things I think we can all say is the pandemic has changed our world. Uh, we are not the same world we were pre-pandemic. Uh, it has changed us in, in a number of aspects, how we view our, ourselves, how we view the world around us, how we view others, how we view uh, government, how we view a lot of things that, that uh, changed because of what we experienced through this pandemic. And oftentimes, what we experience and how we relate to that experience and how we express what we have experienced is how we define it. If we define that experience as something uh, traumatic. If we define that experience as something uh, that has altered our course of life or altered our way of living. It's certainly something that is going to affect how we adjust to that and that we have to put in perspective for families. How has this changed our world and how do we view how that change has happened to us as a family? Next slide, please. One of the earliest studies that we have and some of the most recent uh, research that we have, we can all say pretty uh, fluently and with confidence based on what we know from the research as well as the surveys and experience as ourselves. We're not immune from this ourselves. So when we're talking about families, we're talking about our own as well, not just external to ourselves. But what has happened to us that changed our world, the social isolation, the physical health threats, the financial impact, the shutdown of health, uh, of child serving programs and entities like schools and civic organizations, addition of, of the, uh, the risk in itself. All of this has pushed oftentimes the emotional and mental stability of the family to a breaking point. And many of the studies and papers and surveys that we're getting back 
are saying that parents are at a place where they feel they have reached that maximum of their ability to uh, to be able to to uh, you know manage their resources, manage what's going on with them. The areas which have found to be the most high stressed in a number of of uh, surveys has been a balancing act that parents and families have had tried to do between their work, whether they're able to have work and work from home or whether they're out of work, lost their jobs, their child's well-being and their devotion to and need to attend to the child's well-being and the well-being of themselves as well as extended family members. All of that stress of trying to manage that is occurring at around the same time. So it's, it's, it's pushed these families to a very significant breaking point. In addition to that, some of the things that families normally had that was uh, structures that kept intact the well-being of the family outside of the home, the things that they were accustomed to doing, including uh, social activities like sporting events and, and social entity uh, activities outside of the home. All of these things helped bring stability and made, uh, made uh, well, uh, uh, family welfare much stronger were eliminated, or at least they were uh, restricted. And many families feel like these things occurring simultaneously, this added stress and balancing act with the limit to the social connectedness and the limit to these external resources that they had and outside the home activities that helped manage the structure of the family and give them a sense of stability. All of this occurring at the same time pushed families to the edge. And many are still at that point of being at the edge of their ability to cope and the resources that they have to manage what they were faced with as a result of the pandemic. Next slide, please. One of the studies, and we several of the studies we'll be looking at were done in late fall of last year. One of them was in Australia of about 2,100 families of a diverse backgrounds of parents. And this kind of gives us some of the points that uh, indicated problem areas that many families were reporting as a result of the pandemic. The first bullet point says that many parents and families were concerned over the deterioration of mental health in themselves, their children, and their families. It seemed very apparent from the almost uh, first few months of the pandemic that parents, families, individuals were reporting that their stress and the uh, limitation of resources, the social restrictions that were placed on people and all the other threats that were, uh, that were to well-being had pushed people's mental health to a breaking point. Many were saying that their mental health was much worse than they had seen in the past. And as a result of that, they were feeling very very uh, concerned over what's going to be the future of our mental stability. In particular, they were concerned over the mental stability of their children. Some of the things that they were reporting, and you'll see this in some of the graphs we'll show in a moment, was high levels of anxiety, high levels of depression, and the beginnings of what they identified as post-traumatic stress disorder. Although that often does not occur until the aftermath of a disaster, uh, in the midst of a lengthy disaster, it can occur during that time. And so as that is occurring, uh, they were beginning to see these symptomologies of these mental health concerns. The second bullet point goes back to that statement made earlier about the restrictions to the external social networks and social activities that families were engaged in that helped bring stability to the well-being of the family. When those were shut down because families were restricted to being either socially isolated, quarantined, or shelter in place, uh, kind of orders that came out, and they were not out, uh, allowed to go out into the community like they had previous to the pandemic, uh, those kinds of things made families feel that they were trapped, stuck in the home, and that they were missing activities that made them feel normal and made them feel like these were things that helped keep uh, uh, some of the well-being and happiness 
of the family, these engaging activities outside the home. They felt very concerned that this was contributing to a negative psychological impact on the family as a whole. The third bullet point, families were reporting strained relationships, that the relationships were being affected by the stress of the pandemic and these other conditions of being in the home all the time and not being able to get out and not having the social supports, that relationships were being challenged. And that's not just between parents, but relationships between children and their parents and between siblings in the home. And that these stressors that were occurring were pushing uh, families to really have some very negative interactions in their relationships. Children were bickering and fighting with one another. Uh, they may have been demanding more attention and parents already stressed and stretched very thin were feeling uh, uh, you know, overwhelmed by these ex uh, additional demands of their children. And that was creating conflict between them and the child, as well as between the parents. We know that financial uh, stress oftentimes creates hostility and strained relationships uh, between parents and between couples. So putting all this together, families were saying we are having a, a huge impact, negatively impacted by our relationships as a result of the stress of the pandemic. Next slide, please. Families were also reporting that they were uh, unable to give as much attention to their children due to the increased family de demands and other responsibilities. Those included things like trying to work from home or being out of a job and trying to find it, additional household chores, additional cleaning that may have been added to the family routine, uh, maybe more trips to the grocery store for uh, essential supplies that, that the store was out of and they had to go multiple times, trying to homeschool in the virtual platform with schools being shut down. All of these added responsibilities placed on parents. Parents were reporting in this particular study that they were feeling that they were unable to give the attention to their child that they had previously been given or needed to give to nurture that child. They were trying to balance that work, homeschooling, household chores, and it was just, uh, some cases, impossible or difficult to manage. And as a result, unfortunately, children didn't get the attention that the parents felt that they had previous to the pandemic or that they needed. And if you look at these four bullet points, they kind of interrelate to one another. What happens when a child, especially a young child, doesn't get the attention that they need? What happens when they're frightened or they're concerned for their security? They oftentimes act out in tantruming or crying or, or demanding attention. And that goes back to the strained relationships, the children demanding that of their parents, the parents already trying to struggle with other stressors in the home. And, and maybe stress between uh, the couple themselves, the parents themselves. And added to that, their concern for their child's well being and their mental health. All of these things kind of intertwined together and created this, this uh, boiling pot, this pressure cooker of stress and dysfunctionality that had, in this report, much of a negative effect on the family unit's mental health. Another study at the same time in the late fall in Canada had the same similar uh, uh, results. It basically said that the conclusions were 44% of the families and parents that they surveyed were reporting that they had worse mental health as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we can take these two studies and we'll look at some others. And the ultimate, uh, uh, I think, conclusion is pandemic has had a serious psychological effect on a high number of families. Next slide, please. This is a slide that kind of shows you about the mental health condition that adults, these include parents, that were reporting as a result of the pandemic. And you look at this graph done by the Kaiser Family Foundation around anxiety and depressive disorders and the symptoms of anxiety and depression. In January through June of 2019, you see that it was about 11% of adults were reporting 
having those kinds of symptoms. By January of this year, that had risen to 41%. So when you look at that, it's very vivid how significant the psychological impact is of the pandemic on adults. And that's the adults who are the head of the family. The adults are leading these families. So as their mental health is being challenged and as they're seeing a deterioration in their mental health, it's going to have a trickling out effect, a vicarious effect on the rest of the family unit including the children. Next slide, please. Another survey was done, and this was really by uh, the APA, American Academy of Pediatrics. It was of 3,000 parents and caregivers, and this was done uh, uh, really early in the, in the pandemic and kind of carried through as an ongoing survey, beginning back in March when the pandemic really began, March of last year, March of 2020 about what was some of the financial impacts, what was the disruptions to the family routines, and what was also the positives and negatives that the pandemic had had in the lives of, of parents and caregivers. And the again, the report was pretty overwhelming that they reported that there was first a significant fi negative financial impact on the family that was adding additional stress. Keep in mind, as we look at this, we're looking at it through the gauge of a child. A child often gauges the level of tension and distress in their environment by that which they observe from their parents and caregivers. So if they're watching their parents and caregivers distressed significantly, maybe over things like their finances in the home, the child may not understand or have virtually little to no impact on the finances themselves, but they are observant of the impact that's having on their parents and their caregivers. It's going to relate to them as something in our in, in the environment is very distressing. And so they are going to act on that with fear and anxiety and apprehension and not knowing exactly what it is that there is causing the tension necessarily, just that there's tension and that's distressing and that's scary. And therefore, they act on that often with uh, acting out behaviors, attention demanding behaviors, and uh, depressive kinds of behaviors, crying and withdrawing and those kinds of things. So it's financial peace, although it may not have a direct input by a child, certainly the stress of that has this tripling effect that's going to affect the children and the unit of the family as a whole. Next slide, please. One of the things you see in this slide does show that although there was a 40% of the uh, participants in the survey who reported that it was a negative impact of the, their finances as a result of the pandemic, 47% uh, said that things stayed about the same. Now, keep in mind when they said stayed about the same, we don't know the financial situation of the family pre-pandemic. So if they were already having financial struggles and challenges before the pandemic, pandemic may not have contributed to that. Uh, it may have stayed the same, but the stress was already present. So we have to kind of take that in mind as well. But it was something, uh, I guess, I, I, some positive to see that at least 47% said we had not experienced a significant change as a result, negative change as a result of the pandemic. Next slide. Also, as this a result of this study, nearly all the parents reported that the pandemic had significantly affected normal daily routines. Uh, I think any of us would say we wouldn't know how it could not with the shutdown of schools, the businesses that were closing, people getting uh, laid off or out of work, uh, the shelter in place orders that were coming out. Uh, I think anyone could naturally look at that and say it's going to affect the routines normal structure of those routines. Most families uh, had a certain structure of activities that they engaged in, in a, either daily or weekly or throughout the course of their uh, of the month that was part of their normality of the family. And when things were shut down and closed and those things couldn't happen, it certainly shook up the routine of the family. None more affected by that than children. The routine for children, which is part for a child, there are sense of security 
was significantly disrupted. I mean, they're going to school, their uh, socialization in the community, they're going out with other family members, their engagement in other, with other children out in the uh, community and other settings. All of that was changed during the pandemic and that certainly affected that sense of security and that sense of well-being that children had. Parents, all, most all of them in this survey said, there was a major change in our normal routines. Parents also cited that, uh, again, that, that difficulty trying to balance that work, homeschooling and family management. And they also uh, reported that there were significant effects uh, in the families in this survey with low income or low income working parents who either lost their income or could not work from home because of the nature of their job. Uh, and they were trying to figure out how to make a living. And there was also, as a result of this particular study, a uh, report of worsening mental health issues in minority families as well. Next slide. It is important to note, and we mentioned a little bit of this when we looked at that slide about finances, that although there was a major impact on the family financially and a major impact uh, on their daily routines and structure, there were families that found there to be some positives that came out of these changes that occurred as a result of things like homeschooling and the <clears throat> shelter in place orders that brought families uh, in close proximity under one roof together. And there was some that kind of had a mix between negatives and positives. And although that is, that's, that's, that's good to see that, there was some warnings in this study about uh, uh, not taking that uh, with with a, a complete naivety of thinking, well, there's a lot of families that's going to be just fine because they report there was positive outcomes or positive interactions as a result of the of the pandemic effect. Next slide, please. This kind of shows you that uh, that rating and how that uh, how that rating went. About 31% reported some positives about the homeschooling piece. 29% were kind of in that mixed range. The next slide, please. This next slide kind of speaks to that warning about uh, how that, uh, although they may be reporting, there's some positivity because there was closer bonding. We had more time with our children. We were able to, to engage in, uh, in our child's lives in a little, a little more personal way than we were before we had the homeschooling or before we had the shelter in place and we're at home and, and we're working from home. So that there was some closeness to this and 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 uh, some more bonding, and and that may be well the case, but the researchers warn that there may, even though they may be making that report, underlying stressors as well, that those may be under the surface, and this uh, positivity may be the front line of what they're experiencing at the moment, but these underlying stressors that were running concurrently with these positive experiences may surface. And so it's important to screen for those and be aware of those. And although we want to support the positivity that families uh, identify uh, that went through the pandemic, not to, uh, not to dismiss or not to ignore that there may still be stressors and tensions that's under the surface that may, uh, may come to the surface or come out later in time as we move past the pandemic and move on to uh, post-pandemic activities and experiences. Next slide, please. One of the things that we gauge uh, what we can expect as far as the emotional and mental health effects on individuals and families, since we are dealing with things that may be unprecedented or something that we mostly have not experienced to the degree in which we've experienced this pandemic, is to look back at what other events have occurred that were disastrous events or traumatic events and how families and individuals responded to those events. And that gives us some predictability to what we may be ex expecting to experience as a result of this event. In the past, we have seen that economic crises and I think we can say based on the reports that parents have given that this has had a significant, a significant economic effect on a high number of parents. And as a result of that, 
And what our experience has been in the past when there has been these economic crises, even going as far back as the Great Depression, that the result of that stress in the home on parents and the mental health toll that it has taken and the interparental conflict that created as a result of that stress resulted in increased harsh and sometimes abusive parenting styles. That sometimes this stress mitigated into behaviors and actions that were dysfunctional. May be harsh parenting or even abusive parenting. And the stress may have come out toward either their, their partner in the, in the family, the other adult, or toward the children. We are just now beginning to start to hear about some of the reports of domestic violence and even abuse that may have occurred back during the pandemic. And I think maybe over the months, maybe years, uh, in, in the aftermath of this pandemic, we will see more of that perhaps become evident. And we need to be prepared to be able to address that. But uh, again, historically, when there has been these kinds of stressors in the home, it often leads to these negative parenting styles that can uh, oscillate into violence or abusive uh, kinds of activities that, uh, that can be very dysfunctional and hard to deal with in a family. Next slide. In a most recent study, this is probably one that's, that's uh, a little closer toward the end of the 2020 year and the beginning of 2021, in a report in an article by Mark Feinberg, uh, basically took a summary of this, of this study of parents and said that pretty much what we've been hearing so far, based on the findings of a large negative impacts of the pandemic on parenting and child well-being, we believe it's important to consider the possibility these negative impacts will persist after the pandemic. Next slide. The study was basically reporting a scarring effect. And by that, they took an analogy, again, going back to that economic crisis uh, kind of uh, scenario, that when there has been an economic crisis that resulted in a significant uh, structural change or disruptional change in businesses, financial markets, there was a scarring effect of that event that, re that uh, often caused a more difficult recovery process. This particular study, according to Feinberg, uh, their indications are there we may see a similar scarring effect in families as a result of the psychological impact of this COVID-19 pandemic. And this scarring could create a more challenge recovery process. Next slide, please. It could be, as, as in this study, that the scarring is the result of parental mental health issues, depression and anxiety, co-parenting conflict between the parents themselves, either in the same house or if they're not in the same house, the co-parenting conflict, individual child stress itself that has not been addressed or treated. Nothing has come out and actually identified this that needs some intervention. This could create this ongoing scarring effect. The research according to this, that parent depression and co-parenting quality are interrelated. In other words, depressed parents often have not the highest quality parenting perhaps, or parent co-parenting relationship as those who are not dealing with that mental health challenge of depression or other mental health issues. So again, study about the, the scarring, the scarring effect could be a phenomenon that could lead to long-term psychological and relationship difficulties. So I think we are still waiting to see if they're going to have this ongoing scarring effect. Preliminary data suggests it certainly could be the case. Next. National Institute uh, of Health did a study, a review of 65 
different papers and studies regarding the mental health related to the, uh, to the pandemic. And they identified some at-risk groups from that study uh, that would be the most at risk of having ongoing long-term psychological effects of the pandemic. In those groups was medical staff, those who were at the front line dealing with the, uh, the medical condition of people who, who have contracted the virus. Uh, those were the ones at most risk themselves of getting the virus, watching people suffer with this virus, watching people uh, pass away with the virus. Those individuals who were experiencing that trauma uh, event firsthand, certainly they would be at risk of ongoing psychological uh, effects of the trauma. Children were identified in the list, especially young children. Uh, if we think about the length of time of this uh, event, it's well now moving on to 18 months and more. We're not entirely out of it yet. We can't say we're entirely post pandemic. We are certainly hopefully on the uh, other side and in the downward side of this pandemic, but we can't say necessarily we're completely out of it yet. But uh, we certainly can see how long this has been. If you think about a year's time in the developmental progress of a child, that's huge, especially for young children and children who are adolescent age. That's another developmental period uh, that, that, uh, that's significant. That's a long time. And when you have this much trauma going on in that lengthy period of time, then it's certainly going to put these children at a higher risk for ongoing psychological effects from the pandemic. Those, with, uh, those who are older, the senior citizens are also, especially those who may have lost their support system during this time, faced an even deeper level of isolation uh, during COVID-19. They may be at, uh, at higher risk. Uh, those who had underlying health and mental health conditions pre-pandemic are going to be at a higher risk. Those who are going into the pandemic may be coping well with their mental health issues, but this certainly could result in a setback of those conditions and an increase in symptomology they're going to be having challenges. And then those affected by the, the, the virus itself, those who actually contracted the virus and maybe have had se severe uh, repercussions as a result. Maybe they had to go on a ventilator or maybe they were at a life threatening place with the virus. Certainly those individuals would be at a higher risk for some ongoing psychological effects of the, of the pandemic. And the final conclusion of this review of all these papers and studies was we can all have experienced to uh, expect to have experienced some level of trauma. Trauma seems to be at the forefront of uh, terminology when it's related to what we went through as, as this pandemic. And there's a lot being talked about trauma now, and I'm glad to hear that. And, and uh, with the ACEs study and a lot about trauma-informed care and trauma evidence-based treatment and, and trauma-informed agencies and organizations, very important. And certainly in the aftermath of what we have experienced in 2020, trauma has to be something that we take into account. And when we think of how we, again, going back to the statement I made earlier about how we define an event, when we define the events of 2020 and we define those events as traumatic on us individually and on our family as a whole, then how do we, how do we define what that trauma was? And there are multiple definitions of trauma. We think of it as, a, as an event, a uh, significant event that disrupted the normal uh, coping mechanisms of an individual, had a life-threatening component to it, uh, was severely uh, psychologically affecting an emotional response from us. All of those kinds of definitions of trauma. But uh, next slide, please. This is a definition that I think really fits well with how we can define trauma in retrospect to 2020 and the pandemic. And this is from Dr. David Tricky, a psychologist at the UK. And he basically defines trauma as a rupture in the meaning making systems of an individual. In other words, the way that we see ourselves, the way that we see the world around us and that the way we see other people. When an event is so significant 
and so shocking that it overturns our normal way of seeing ourselves, our world, and those around us, then there is a gap that arises between our orienting systems, because that's how we define how we fit in this world, as how we view ourselves, the world around us, and the world and others. When there is a gap that, cre that is created uh, in our orienting systems, then that often cascades into trauma that's mediated or sustained by a sense of helplessness. One of the things I heard a lot last year when I met with a, a number of people with their mental health was they felt helpless. There were so limited things that we could do. I mean, we could take the precautions that the CDC gave as recommendations, the face coverings, the sanitation, the distancing from others, social distancing, all of those things. But we felt helpless as this this uh, this virus was spreading, uh, you know, massively across our country, across our state. This sense of helplessness, and it really challenged us into thinking about uh, our world and the uh, ourselves in that world and those around us. Uh, we had seen pandemics. It's not the first pandemic. We'd seen health crises uh, in other countries and around the world, but this one came home to us and hit us at home and in our own backyard, in our own families. Uh, it really shook that meaning-making system of how we viewed our invulnerability to these kinds of experiences. And that has created in itself a trauma that we're dealing with as individuals and as a family. That has become termed now as collective trauma. When we think of trauma, typically we think of it uh, in one of three categories, either an acute event, something that comes suddenly and gone suddenly. Uh, it's traumatic. Uh, it certainly disrupted our, our normal life's, uh, life activities, but it comes suddenly, it's gone suddenly, and we can begin the healing and the recovery fairly soon after the event because it's, it's come and it's gone. It's an acute kind of event. Uh, it's still traumatic. We still have to go through the recovery process and deal with it, but it's it's come and it's gone. We may have had little to no warning uh, about the event. It's here it hits. We think of a tornado maybe or a natural disaster being something that of, of an acute traumatic event. Then there is the chronic traumatic event. That's when an event goes on and on. It may take different venues or different ways in which we are traumatized by this singular event, but it is an event that lasts on and on. We may think of child abuse or domestic violence that may fit under the canopy of a chronic traumatic experience. It's a long lasting experience. It goes on for a, a lengthy period of time. And although we learn to cope or we find ways to maybe survive the experience as we go through it, Many times the recovery and the true healing uh, takes it is delayed uh, until we have uh, overcome or come out from under the traumatic experience. And, and then there is complex trauma. That's when we have multiple traumatic experiences occurring either simultaneously or in close proximity to one another. They may be interrelated or they may not be. Your house catches fire and you hear about it and you're rushing home to see what the what's happened at the home that's burning and you have a car accident on your way and someone's injured in the car accident. You've got the trauma of the house fire, you've got the trauma of the accident, you've got the trauma of someone being injured. All of these are traumatic events and they're occurring maybe close proximity to one another, but each on their own without the other would be a traumatic experience. Complex trauma is all of those kinds of things. Collective trauma, we can sort of think about we look back at 2020 being an event that affected a large number of people, the whole world virtually, all the industrialized world and our entire nation, we think of it in the United States, the great population of people and basically had all three classifications of trauma embedded within it. It come on quickly. Uh, we watched it happen, but then when it finally hit the United States, it spread so rapidly it was almost we weren't prepared for that kind of massive acute spread that took place. Certainly lasted chronically longer than anybody anticipated, 
I can remember back in March of last year thinking this would be over by Easter, and it wasn't. Then it would be over by June and July, and it wasn't. And then comes fall. Well, surely it's going to die out in the fall, and it didn't. We had a surge in the fall, and it's lasted now going on 18 months. It, much longer than I think anyone ever anticipated. So it's a chronic event. It's continuing on and on. And then the complexities of it, we had not only the health threat of people getting sick, we had the financial impact of people losing their jobs. We had the, uh, the shut, shut down of social structures, multiple traumatic events occurring with under that umbrella of this pandemic event. So it kind of had all of those together. And and, and gravitated into what we now call this collective trauma experience. Next slide, please. So it is an event that elicits an emotional response to a large number of people. It's the same event having different vignettes within that event, and it elicits an emotional response. Now, the response may be different depending on how much of that uh, trauma it directly affected you. I mean, if you were kind of vicariously affected because you weren't, uh, you never had to quarantine or you never caught the virus or someone that you loved uh, didn't pass away from it, you may not have had some of those kind of traumas. Uh, it was still elicit an emotional response because the danger was there, the threat was there, the reality of you could get sick, you had to do these, these restrictions and things. So it elicited an emotional response from everybody involved, and that's regardless of your individual diversities. It creates a psychological upheaval. In other words, it kind of uh, it kind of uh, uh, shook the psychological framework that we may have had in our country and in our lives individually. And that last bullet point, it leaves its mark on each person and the society. So it affects us individually, and it affects us societally. That's kind of the framework of a collective traumatic experience. And most of us feel like we can put the pandemic in that category of trauma. Next slide, please. So when we're thinking of this traumatic experience and we put it in the framework of this disaster of 2020 of the pandemic, there are certain things that mitigate how this experience is felt by us as individuals and as families. And some of those are protective factors protective factors that kind of buffet us from the reality of the harshness and the overcoming of the psychological upheaval that's being created by this disastrous event, this traumatic event. Here are some of the things that, that are protective factors that help some families recover or mitigate through the trauma of the pandemic better than maybe others would have. The resiliency in the family before the disaster. How resilient was that family? How were they at coping with adversity? How was the family unit as far as being able to handle uh, uh, multiple stressors? Uh, maybe they were well equipped to do that. Maybe they had had those kinds of experiences and had dealt with them and learned from the past. And now as they face these new experiences, they took that information or that experience and brought it to the forefront and that gave them a resiliency that helped them mitigate through this new experience of the pandemic. So how resilient was the family unit as a whole uh, during the pandemic? What was the functionality of the family during the disaster? Uh, what was uh, the, the individual abilities within the family to cope, uh, the children's ability to cope, the parents' ability to cope? How functioning was it? Was it was it functioning really well? Was it structured really well? Was it was the family uh, being able to communicate well? You know, part of a dysfunctional family is a breakdown in communication or a change in in a, in a appropriate and healthy communication style. So, how functional was the family? That's going to also mitigate the, the impact of the disaster. The support systems. How supported did the uh, support uh, did the family have going into this event? Were there strong supports already in place in the community, in the home, uh, in, the, in their uh, uh, organizations that they were involved with? How supported did they have? And, and were these supports able to continue once the pandemic had happened? So how, how, what was the network of support? And the stronger the network of support in place prior to the pandemic, the better they were able to mitigate the ex, uh, ex, uh, experiences of the pandemic. And then, of course, their access to external resources. 
that may be mental health or physical health or other resources that they need. How, how available were these supports and resources for them? How available were they to know how to, to access those services uh, that they needed once the pandemic began? So having that, uh, that reliability on uh, being able to contact external and internal resources. Next slide. In a, in, as well as the protective factors, there is the risk factors. And these risk factors put more vulnerability on the psychological effect of the traumatic experience on these families. These may be the families that may have more challenges in the recovery and the healing process post pandemic. Of course, the first one is the dysfunctionality of the family itself. Was there already dysfunction? How much dysfunction was there during the pandemic uh, were they experiencing? We look at a 2018 study of the effects of dysfunctionality in the in the family, and this can, in, when we think of what it what it means to be dysfunctional, it can have a lot of different uh, definitions. It can be a, a an abusive or a, a negative, neglectful parenting style. It can be poor uh, communication. Uh, it can be uh, uh, parentifying a child's role, role reversals in the phone. Um, many of those things can be part of what we would define as a dysfunctional uh, family situation. But we know that when there is families that have these kinds of dysfunctions, that often children grow up experiencing heightened feelings of anxiety, conflict, and hostility. And many of these children, because of the lack of security and the lack of protection that they feel in the homes when there is this level of dysfunction, often are not able to to identify or mitigate fears appropriately, age appropriately, and often have uh, inappropriate responses to fears that would not be age level for that child. So it's, it affects their developmental progress as well. So what was the dysfunctionality in the home before the pandemic happened? Was there pre-existing mental health and substance abuse issues? Of course, that can feed into the dysfunctionality, but if those were present, especially with the caregivers and, and the parents in the home, uh, that's certainly going to put at risk additional stressors, creating more problems with the, with the family. That's going to take recovery and, and, and healing a little bit longer. A poor support system, going back to what we just said about support systems, if they didn't have much of a support system before, it's going to affect the resiliency of the family as a whole. We know that one of the essential uh, uh, characteristic resiliency is connectedness. We also know that it's important as a pillar of mental health and overcoming adversity is relationship with others. And when there is not a relationship with others, when you're already isolated and don't have a support system, it's certainly going to put you at higher risk of a greater psychological impact of a traumatic experience. Uh, poor access to mental and physical uh, health services, if they were already limited having access to those services, or if they had uh, uh, needed those services or didn't have knowledge of how to access those services, uh, that's certainly going to put them at higher risk. Financial stress, we've already mentioned that one a few times, it's certainly going to put uh, additional stress on the home and the environment, and that can create more at risk factors for a psychological upheaval. And then of course, the severity of the impact itself. How much were you as an individual and as a family impacted by this, this traumatic experience? Uh, were people in your home uh, that caught the virus and passed away? Did you catch the virus yourself and were absent and unable to be there to help uh, provide parenting or guidance to your children or, or guidance to the household? I mean, all of these, how, how close to the, the severity of the impact was it to you as an individual and to you as the family is certainly going to put the risk factor at a higher level. Next slide, please. So we have this collective experience. We have this family experience of the pandemic, but the family experience is really a collage or a collection of the individuals within that household. You are a makeup, uh, the whole is made up of the parts. So the family is made up of the individuals within that household that create that family. So even though the family, uh, you know, may be having some strengths and may have some strong resiliencies, if we individually as part of that family unit 
are struggling with the impact of this traumatic experience, it will ripple effect the, the outcome of the family itself and how the family itself is dealing with this pandemic. So I think it's important for us to look at how we individually deal with or have dealt with what we experienced in 2020. And sometimes when we look at uh, at the stages of an individual dealing with a disaster, they often mimic those we see with grief. Maybe it's because there's loss often associated with trauma and disasters, but oftentimes we see some of those same characteristics in individuals as they go through the stages of dealing with a disaster, the same as we would as dealing with grief. The shock effect, uh, I think we can all remember back when we were watching this on TV and suddenly we saw this this virus and it's starting to spread. And it, we were in, we were kind of in a state of shock. We watched it starting in Asia and moving through Europe and coming this way. We, we figured it was going to come to us. We come quicker and, and happen more acutely than we anticipated it. But we were kind of shocked when it finally did hit and spread like it did and, and, and across the country and across our state. So there was this shock effect, the denial. We can remember back to the denial stage where we Oh, it's not really as bad as they're saying. They're not telling us everything. The government's hiding stuff from us. They're not revealing all the, the things that's going on. It's not really that bad. They're just making this up to make it worse than it really should be. We begin the denial of how really, truly traumatic this experience is going to be. The bargaining, well, you know, we're going to, we're going to get through this. We're going to be okay. We're going to make it. We're, we're going to uh, work together to overcome this. We'll fight this invisible enemy together. And we begin to bargain about how we were going to negotiate, how we were going to deal with this trauma of this pandemic and anger. My goodness, we saw a lot of anger. And anger is still present, I think, in many uh, areas of, about the pandemic, the anger of, uh, with various entities, whether it's anger at the virus itself or the government or other people groups or or restrictions just a lot of people are feeling frustration and impatience and anger and of course again thinking in the family that mitigates itself out into the family and tentacles that anger is not composed just out in the in the uh, social arena it sometimes comes out in our interactions with one another in the household and then the depression that sense of loss that we experience we lost 2020 in a lot of ways. We didn't able to do the things we anticipated doing, and that's led a lot of people to a sense of, of, of feeling grief and depression. We can't go back to 2020 and, and redo it. Uh, and sometimes I wish we could. We don't want to go back and relive it, but we could redo it, but we can't. And, and that's left a lot of people feeling depressed. And we saw that depression went up significantly during the pandemic. And then finally, that level of acceptance where we are accepting this is well, this is the new world, this is the new normal, this is where we are. Let's go on and move forward. Of course, when you put that traumatic experience in the framework of a child who without the, uh, the ability of independent uh, decision making or a complete understanding of what the trauma is really all about, it certainly creates a higher level of distress for a child. And we saw this and are seeing this with children this higher level of distress and then the length of it, as we've already said, that creates again an additional distress in the developmental history of a child. So all of this is creating this <clears throat> ongoing distress that we're seeing with kids and families. Next slide. As we take the, the <clears throat> surveys and studies that we've had and kind of boil them down, what are parents most concerned with about their family and their kids. And these are the bullet points from that in kind of a summary. First, parents are reporting that their children are more withdrawn than usual and accompanying decreases in sleep and appetite as we started 2021. Of course, when you think about that withdrawing, changes in sleep, changes in appetite, it sort of sounds like early stages of symptoms of depression. So I think parents are concerned that they're seeing their children more depressed than they were uh, last year or certainly before that in 2019. Parents are describing decreased face-to-face -face social opportunities for their children and are concerned about how much time children are spending online. Well, I think that's a given. 
as we were forced into a virtual world, it forced us into a platform of virtuality. And homeschooling put us in a place of virtuality. It put kids in front of computer screens more. And as we know, that when we are uh, eliminated from that personal face-to-face -face physical interaction with another person, we have data to support that that can create a socialization barrier for children in learning how to socialize and how to read social cues and how to interact in a human-to-human -human interaction contract contest with another person. And so parents are concerned with that. And, and legitimately so. We're seeing uh, internet addiction beginning to rise, and we're hearing more about internet addiction among teens and early adolescents. And I think parents' concern over all of the FaceTime that children are having on the computer and not as much socialization, it's having an effect on their socialization skills and their interactive skills. We were seeing and hearing at the end of last year that educators were already reporting in schools that children were having more trouble uh, with uh, language and with, uh, with interacting in groups, with sharing with others, those kinds of things that they had seen in groups of children previous to 2020. Substance misuse, significant concern for many parents, very well concerned. We found in 2020 that many adolescents <clears throat> were using illegal drugs and alcohol to self-medicate. ED visits increased from March through October of last year, and pediatricians were reporting that they heard adolescents saying in these ED visits for crisis services for kids that, uh, that our parents' medicine chest is a great place for Xanax and Valium, these, these uh, benzodiazepines. So we're, we're seeing that kids started using earlier and more frequently last year than had been seen in previous years. So I think that's a concern that's well-rooted and, and one that we need to be very mindful of. Uh, by the way, we had the highest uh, percentage of, of uh, uh, overdose deaths in 2020 of any in recorded time for us in the recorded years, and a higher percentage increase in any single year than we've seen in any previous year. So uh, we have a significant issue with substance misuse amongst all ages, but especially I think we need to be mindful of that for children. Parents are worried about children being behind in school and how frustrating it is for their children. I think certainly we are all concerned about uh, are we going to be able to capture the loss of schooling and education that we had last year when we had to go to a virtual world, school shut down, and, and going back and forth between in-person and virtual in that context of how behind are kids in their academic level and how frustrating is this for children who want to be at grade level and want to learn and trying to, to, uh, to, to rapidly uh, go back to, to grade level and stress on teachers and educators and children certainly is creating an additional stress in the home and parents are concerned about their children's academic level and the frustration that this is creating for their children. Next slide, please. Speaking of that, nearly nine in 10 parents, according to studies that we have seen, are worried about their children falling behind academically. That's higher than any other issue, financial or socioeconomic concern. Eight out of 10 parents say that their children are experiencing heightened levels of stress, anxiety, as a result of feeling they were behind on their academic level and not being able to, to stay up grade level and be competitive in a, a, a very commercial marketplace and competitive marketplace when they graduate through high school. So very high concern and legitimate so. Next slide. Did we skip one? We may have skipped one. Yes, here. The last, this uh, is kind of an overarching concern that parents stated, and it's concerned over the lifestyle changes of their children. It, it really takes into a, into a and accompaniment a lot of the things that they were concerned about with the uh, uh, stress on their children, with the uh, FaceTime on the computer. Uh, how is this going to change their lifestyle? And in, including in that, it's not only 
uh, spending less physical activity, and is that going to change their their uh, their nutritional habits to create more obesity? Is it going to change their socialization habits? Are they going to have people making friends, socializing? Uh, that going to change their lifestyle? But a lot of unhealthy habits they're concerned with that may be uh, coming to surface as a result of of this interconnectedness uh, to the to the internet and these changes that occurred during the during the uh, pandemic. So lifestyle changes, parents are concerned that how's this going to mitigate into the future? Next slide, please. So what, what, what we did experience, what we can all say we experienced as a result of this pandemic as a unit, as families, as individuals, the social isolation was there, the structural support changes that took place, the physical health threat of the virus, the losses that so many people experienced through the death of individuals, the job losses, dreams that were lost as a result of the pandemic, the housing and food insecurity, again going back to the economic issues, uh, the political and civil unrest that was that was that was paralleling the uh, the uh, health crisis that we were experiencing, whether they were interrelated or not interrelated, some what uh, a little bit of both, and with political and civil unrest that was creating tension in families and tension across the country, and then there were moral dilemmas. That we were faced with as a nation that perhaps we hadn't faced before the allocation and ratio of survival supplies we only had so many ventilators how many people would get them and who wouldn't be getting them and who made the choice who got one and who didn't and dr perry dr perry we have lost your connection with the internet We see you now, Dr. Perry. It looks like uh, looks like your microphone may be on. Oh. Are we back again? I hear you. Yes, sir. I don't see anything I don't see on you, my but end? I hear you. And that's you know, okay. Okay. Well, we'll 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 keep trying to mitigate through this. We uh, this is part of technology. Wonderful when it works. It is. It gives you opportunities to learn so new am things. I. <laughs> Yes, sir. I can I can hear you and see you. So so far so, so are we, good. Are we, are we good. Well, your your audio is a little bit squirrely there. All right, um, we'll keep going through that. Yeah, you, if you want to, yeah, if you want, you can turn your video off if you want to. You may it may give you more uh, connection on your internet. See if this is helping with the with the. Uh, audio i hear you great i do hear you just great i okay. like seeing you but it may it just may help you and sherry through that thank you sherry all right well go ahead uh Dr. thank sherry. you i appreciate and that this yeah this is fascinating okay, i'm slide. just like we're all kind of chatting over here yeah it's really interesting it's like wow oh yeah. goodness. Okay. okay here we go <laughs> all right all right moving on the post-pandemic emerging family. So what can we expect as in the aftermath of this pandemic for families? What are some of the things we can anticipate? And I've listed 10 here that are really the things that uh, we are seeing already and can anticipate may be able to see. First is the family unit role changes. As the family was structured differently, and the stresses that parents were facing, many of the parents oftentimes uh, had to uh, balance their parenting role with these other responsibilities, including uh, chores and, 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 and work from home, and roles changed. In some cases, we've seen children stepping out into parentified roles, taking care of younger siblings, uh, taking on some other responsibilities that were probably not 
uh, typical age appropriate roles for that child. So in those cases, there was some role changes that occurred within the family. Financial struggles, number two, the added food, housing and child care insecurities. I think we are still seeing families struggling with the financial insecurities that uh, this pandemic has left on so many families. So we're going to have to understand as we work with these families, the financial struggles that they are challenged with that, that creates this intensive increase in stress mitigated throughout the family unit. Relationship changes, we mentioned that as one of the studies indicated that there was going to be, or we're seeing some strained relationships. And as that continues, I think we will continue to see that these relationship struggles are going to be things we will have to work with the family to address. In some cases, I'm hearing reports that it resulted in divorces, in parental separation, in changes in parent styles. So there has been a lot of, of role and relationship changes in the family post pandemic. And we need to be prepared to be able to address that with children and these couples. Of course, the losses, we've already kind of talked about that, the grief issues, uh, many of the, of the things we would normally have done as part of the rite of passage a part of our uh, our finality of, of dealing with loss, we were not able to do. We were not able to have uh, the kind of funeral re uh, relationships or even be there to say goodbye to some families. So the grief process is as prolonged as a result and may start surfacing because we suppressed that in some places. So we need to be prepared to be able to experience uh, grieving families. Uh, Substance misuse, I've already addressed that. I think that's something we're going to have to be on the cusp of, of dealing with in post-merging families. Children going through an adjustment period. Uh, anytime there is a major disruption of change in a child's life, there is going to be adjustment. That change can be within the school structure. It can be within the family structure, especially if there's been separation or changes in the household movements. That's going to create adjustments. So there may be multiple adjustments that a child's going to have to make. The more of these, the lengthier of these that takes place, the longer the period of adjustment. So we may be seeing children trying to adjust to this new world and these changes a year in a, uh, after the pandemic. So we need to be mindful of that. Worsening or new mental health problems, uh, the pace of life that has changed, uh, it was a slowdown for us. Things kind of come to a snail's crawl or a halt during the pandemic. And now that things are getting back to normal, they're speeding back up and the pace of life is speeding back up. So we're, we're getting much faster with that. So the pace of life is speeding up. Some parents may be going through empty nest syndrome again as they had their children back home with them during this shelter in place. Now they're going back to school, back to college or back into public school. And parents are experiencing an empty nest syndrome again, that they may have already went through once before. And then the change, uh, the just the view of the world and society may be changing for some families uh, post pandemic. The way they view healthcare, the way they view the government, even issues of racism in the post pandemic world may have changed. So we may be seeing views of families changing, even their values may be taking on a different perspective in the emergence of the post-pandemic family. So these are some of the things that I think we can anticipate. Next slide, please. How do we address them? Most of the studies that we have found come to this final conclusion. It needs to be a multi-component interdisciplinary approach. It needs to be something that is, that is agency, multiple agency engagement not just a single entity. It's not just going to be the mental health entity. It's not going to be just the Department of Children's Services entity. It's not just going to be the school entity or government entity. It's going to have to be a multi-component interdisciplinary approach if we're going to be able to help these families recover and heal from what they've experienced. Next slide, please.
Here are some of the recommendations for behavioral health interventions to the post-pandemic family. First begins with early screening and detection. We, the, the sooner we can detect that there is problems and the sooner that interventions can begin, the better success for recovery and healing. So again, sooner it starts, the better we will be able to overcome it, the screening and detection process. Trauma, it needs to be trauma-focused evidence-based treatment. Again, trauma needs to be at the forefront of our treatment regimen. And so it needs to be something that has some evidency behind it as being effective. I encourage something that's time oriented, something that can be uh, brought in place that gives the family some tools to work with that can be very successful with them. And then they can, they can mitigate past the uh, intervention experience. So trauma focused evidence-based treatment early, a treatment that encompasses the whole family. It's not just Johnny's problem if he is the adolescent in the home. It's the whole family's issue. It needs to be something that's family oriented and family as a whole. And the whole unit of the family needs to be part of that treatment process and that recovery process. It needs to be a wrap around support uh, unit for the family. In other words, going back to that interdisciplinary, it needs to be something that engages all the support systems possible for this family, for their school, community, faith-based, uh, school, all of those together with community mental health, working on the same page as a full ramp of services for the family. There needs to be follow-up screening and assessment after the pandemic and after treatment. In other words, we need to continue reaching out to families and, in, and checking in on them and screening them, even maybe after they have completed some intervention or some treatment uh, that uh, addresses the trauma. So we need to continue following, and I think we're gonna need this for, uh, for at least another year or so. And then there needs to be more research. Again, we're in the cusp of the aftermath. So as we get further away from the pandemic, uh, the main part of the pandemic, we need to continue research and data collection. Next slide, please. So that's kind of the conclusion of the presentation. And I'm going to open it up for questions and I'm gonna turn it back over to Serena if she can uh, be viewing the chat box and we'll try to uh, navigate a few of these questions. Thank you so much. What a great discussion um, that you presented with us, Dr. Perry. I have that we had so many thoughts going on in the chat box and I'd love to um, ask everyone to type your questions or comments for Dr. Perry into the chat box. And um, I think, you know, a lot of people could relate not only as we serve children and families, but even in our own lives that it has impacted all of us in some way. Um, so it's definitely something we can be empathetic about as we serve families. Um, I'm gonna try to, uh, and, and I did have the question if they'll get a, copy of the PowerPoint and the answer is yes. Um, we will send a PDF of this PowerPoint as well. Um, one question that has come up is with the Delta variant coming about, um, do we, you know, are we in a post pandemic world or, or could we even say that yet or what do you think? That is an excellent, <laughs> you know, that is an excellent question. You know, I did a training and uh, Lindsay was part of this training last week with PCCY and, and I showed a graph of, of kind of the phases of a disaster. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you go through this phase of a disaster where you're in that the beginning to the uh, reconstruction and recovery phase. And during that, there will be setbacks. When there is a health crisis, it's not uncommon to have these reoccurrences and to have these outbreaks reoccur. Uh, I think, uh, you, yes, I, I, I'm the eternal optimist perhaps. I believe we are on the post cusps of the pandemic, but I expect and anticipate that there will be these setbacks and there will be these 
uh, new outbreaks and these new uh, new variances of the virus that will that will rise their head. Now, hopefully, if we look at historical norms, those don't uh, those are not typically as lengthy. Uh, if we we may have to go back and and go back to some of the safety precautions and restrictions that we were experiencing when we had the first out outbreak, uh, but typically they are they are quickly are quicker mitigated, and we are able to get back to the reconstruction and recovery process. But I think, at least from where I'm sitting now, I'm hoping that's what's happening now is we're having one of those setbacks where we're experiencing that that uh, that. Uh, a new outbreak, or it's not really a new outbreak, a variant outbreak, and that hopefully it will be of short duration, and we will be able to then go back to a again another level of normalcy and be able to mitigate past that. Um, that yeah, that sounds fantastic. And let's see, Andrea, it sounds like a lot of people here on our call know people that um, have. COVID um, and so, or that they, you know, that they are acquiring COVID now. Um, so it, it does feel really like people are still in it. Um, I think oh, we- I think, mm -hmm. excuse me, I, th I, think, I, I think we are still in it, Serena. I don't think we're out of the pandemic. I think we're, if we remember back in the days during the pandemic, we had this bell curve where we had this, this we were going up, you know, increasing numbers, and we got to this tough point, and then we started kind of back down. We went up, and we made that back down. I am hopeful that we're on the downward side of that bell-shaped curve. Uh, are we out of it? Not entirely, no. I don't think we are. I think we are on the downward slide of that, and that's kind of where we start that, uh, that process of recovery and recuperation. So I think we are still going to find that we will have these ups and downs, but I'm hopeful, again, I'm hopeful that we are on the place where we are beginning to see the, the light at the end of this tunnel, the, 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 the cusps of being on the downward side of this. Definitely. Um, yeah, I think uh, we had a lot of, there was a lot of discussion going on as you were talking about how this uh, traumatic event left, leaves a scar on the family and even we all experience collective trauma and, how that is kind of, and it's in a way, it's a complex trauma as well, um, with the intersections of what's going on in the social and political environment as well. So, um, yeah, and you know, I think I think the scar, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I think this scarring effect, we we don't really know yet that degree with it. Um, you know, I I use an analogy sometimes. I have a. a, a a cut on my hand that is, had left a scar when I was much younger, and that scar has healed. It took a while to heal, but during the healing process, even when it was beginning to heal, it was very sore and could be easily reopened. And the healing process did not remove the scar. The scar is still there. I can still see the scar, mm -hmm. but uh, when I look at it, it reminds me of what I went through. It reminds me of that event, but I'm able to deal with it. And even though it's it's you know. 35 years later, it still have tender spots with it. I can yes. still touch that and be tender, but I learned to cope with it. So even if we have this scarring effect, I think the hope is that if we get services and screening and interventions in time, people can heal from it and can, can be able to recover from it and have, have normal and healthy lives. Yeah, definitely. That's a great analogy. Um, Let's see, we have a question from Harrison. Do you have any insight in dealing with parents that would prefer the child stay home as school start starts when it is clearly detrimental to the child or children to not have that social interaction and formal instruction? Well, that's a very great, that's a great question because many parents are fearful and especially as we see this this, uh, this rise in the Delta variants about children going back to school in a public arena. We saw this even when we had the, uh, the schools reopening in the fall of last year. We had parents very apprehensive about letting their child go back to school. And for a, very, a variety of reasons, one, they wanted them home to be with them or they were frightened they would catch the virus or the concerns about being in the presence of other children. You know, in, in my experience with that is it's, it's somewhat of an education try to educate the parents about 
need for social development and how that social development occurs in interactions with other human beings and that those other human beings need to be uh, at the same age developmental level so that they can have that same age developmental growth. Children play, uh, learn to pl uh, socialize with play with the other children and they pick up cues from other children and having them, you know, in an adult world only or an adult isolated world where they don't get that socialization with other children can certainly uh, hinder or at least delay them being able to have that social interaction. So what we do on our end when parents are, are, are having those, those difficulties about letting their children go back, start with some psychoeducation about child development and the socialization process and help them answer some of those questions. How do, how do we help a child that needs to be in the presence of other children to learn the socialization skills that they need to develop into adolescents, young adults, and eventually adults. And how do we help them mitigate that? So I think that's a starting point with the parents. Again, there's going to be some that are still resistant to it, but encouraging them. And maybe uh, in some cases, we, we, we've had parents actually uh, meet with the school and talk with the school about you know, what's the safe precautions here? What kind of things can I expect through the school counseling program or mental health services at the school that's available for my child? Uh, going back to school that makes me feel a little safer and a little more confident about allowing my child back in a public setting. All right. Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. And we have another fantastic question from Angie. She says, Dr. Perry, does wearing masks with small children impact that serve and return process? Well, my my experience is um, you know, children are children have been now. The Delta variant is fairly fairly new. We're still learning about it. I think we're still in the in the experimental phase with understanding the Delta variants. <clears throat> the children did not have as high a level of risk of COVID and the original strand as what uh, young adults and adults had uh, originally. But uh, what I can say is, I think there is a a a uh, you know there is a protective factor. Um, I think it, it must correspond with other protective factors, including uh, cleaning and uh, sanitation and kind of uh, social interactions uh, with kids. Uh, I can't say that the mask is or isn't a better protective factor. I follow typically what the CDC's recommendations have been. And uh, I've met with some of the schools and some schools are saying they're not going to have masks required, but they're going to have them permitted if, if the children want to wear them or the parents want them to wear them. Uh, I guess if I was a parent, I would probably say I would, uh, especially children that are middle school and high school age, maybe not as much in elementary school, but certainly at that age range. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Dr. Perry before we close our time together today? Well, it's been really, it's, it's been really refreshing and eye-opening um, to be able to talk about the pandemic within the context of child welfare and mental health and, and those areas. So I really do appreciate you uh, talking with us. Let's see, Kendall asks, with the rise in RSV cases, I'm concerned about my nine month old in daycare. Is there a correlation to COVID or Delta virus variant? I'm not aware of a I'm not aware of a correlation between RSV and the Delta variant. Uh, what I would encourage you to do, though, because there is a significant rise in RSV, we are seeing it go up uh, more than we have seen in the past, uh, and, and there may be a lot of mitigating factors with that. But what I would suggest you to do is speak with your daycare center about what precautions they're taking as as this is going up, and also with your pediatrician. Ask your pediatrician, are there things that you need to be mindful of when you speak with the daycare center that they are taking precautions to avoid the possible exposure to RSV from your child? So have a conversation with your pediatrician, then have a conversation with your daycare center. And I do it in that order so that you are able to, uh, to ask the appropriate question of the daycare center about what precautions are they taking uh, to protect your child from the RSV. Thank you so much. Um, yes, and Susan 
Cope says, thank you for this training. This is great information. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and thank you so much, Dr. Perry, for your time and this wonderful presentation, says Margaret Graves. I cannot wait to share this information with my CASA supervisor and fellow volunteers. Thank you, Margaret, for coming and presenting this information to your colleagues. Nancy Arts says thank you, and we'll be we'll be closing out here uh, again. Thank you so much for joining us in our first edition of the Back to School webinar series with our wonderful. Um, providers and community members. Our next uh, session in this webinar series will be on August 10th, and it is about the intersection of mental health and suicide. Um, definitely something we have uh, concern for uh, in the pandemic and post-pandemic world. Um, so thank you all so much for joining now. I hope to see you on August 10th. And thank you all for joining us. Also, please thank you for sharing this information and having these conversations with your teams. So um, oh, let's see, Caitlin. Oh, let's see. Oh, thank you, Angie. Angie uh, posted the information. It's gonna be August 10th, 930 to 11. Uh, the presenter is Caitlin Inslee and there's a little description in there and the link if you would like to wow thank you angie that's fantastic um and uh if you are interested you can go ahead and register for that session now otherwise dr perry yeah this has been a great way to launch our series um and just open up you know the discussion about these important issues that we're seeing in our own families as well as in other families. Um, so definitely as helping professionals and helping community members, we can you know, open up this conversation about the impact. And I really appreciate you just breaking it all out and letting us know what the, what the research say um, about these issues. So thank you for your work and thank you for being here with us today. My pleasure, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And with that, everyone have a wonderful day and you'll be seeing your, um, you'll be getting certificates or uh, training credit in Edison um, in the next, within the next three weeks. So yes, thank you so much. Shay, thank you for your participation. I'm so glad you'll be able to pass this on to your, your CASA volunteers. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Kristen. Have a great day.